Hello, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Maruk Aidenwala and your course Legal Literacy. This is Module 5. Topic Constitution. In Module 5, we will be discussing constitutional remedies as also what do we understand by directive principles and two directive principles which are article 38 and clause b and c of article 39 these two articles portray the nature of the indian state namely india is a welfare state article 32 comes under the category constitutional remedies and is titled remedies for enforcement of rights conferred by this part our constitution makers made fundamental rights enforceable but they also gave people a fundamental right regarding the remedy which they should take when a fundamental right is violated. The constitution states that if a person's fundamental rights are violated, such individual group of persons may approach the Supreme Court for redressal. Clause 2 states that a person may approach the Supreme Court under its writ jurisdiction. There are five types of writs which the Supreme Court may pass. A writ of habeas corpus, a writ of mandamus, a writ of prohibition, a writ of co-warranto and a writ of certiorari. What is a writ? A writ is an order or a direction passed by a court. The High Court also has the powers of writ jurisdiction. A person also has an opportunity to approach the High Court if their fundamental rights are violated. So a petitioner, who is a petitioner? A petitioner is the person whose fundamental rights are violated and approaches the court. A petitioner may select whether he wants to approach the Supreme Court or the High Court when his fundamental rights are violated. Under Article 32, he is required to approach the Supreme Court and under Article 226, he is required to approach the High Court. But please note that Article 226 does not fall within the part of fundamental rights. But the High Court can also pass all the same five writs which a Supreme Court may pass. The first writ I would like to discuss is the writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is a Latin term which means you have the body. When does a petitioner approach the Supreme Court or High Court for a writ of habeas corpus? He mainly approaches under habeas corpus when a person has been illegally detained without following the fundamental rights or the procedure followed or a procedure laid down under the law. I would first like to discuss the writ of habeas corpus. What does one understand by the term habeas corpus? Habeas corpus is a Latin term which means you have the body. A person would approach the Supreme Court or High Court for a writ of habeas corpus when his family members or friend is illegally detained contrary to the fundamental rights or the procedure laid down under the law. For example, Article 22, Clause 2 states that the person on arrest should be produced before the magistrate within 24 hours. When a person is not produced within 24 hours, it amounts to illegal detention. 
then the family members or his friends may approach the Supreme Court or the High Court seeking his relief. The Umu Sabina case relates with detainees under the preventive detention. These petitioners claimed that their detention was in violation of the fundamental rights, namely Article 22, Clause 5. The Supreme Court, on hearing their case, released all the four detainees. What does this case say with regards to habeas corpus? The writ of habeas corpus is the oldest writ evolved by the common law of England to protect the individual liberty against its invasion in the hands of the executive or maybe also at the instance of private persons. The principle of habeas corpus has been incorporated in our constitutional law and we are of the opinion that in a democratic republic like India, where judges function under a written constitution and which has a chapter on fundamental rights to protect individual liberty, the judges owe a duty to safeguard the liberty, not only of the citizens but also of all persons within the territory of India. The most effective way of doing the same is by way of exercise of powers by the court by issuing a writ of habeas corpus. It is always hoped that the courts re respond urgently when a writ of habeas corpus is filed. The next writ is the writ of mandamus. What do we understand by mandamus? Mandamus means command. A writ of mandamus is generally filed when a state party has a particular duty to perform and such state party fails to perform his duty, which has resulted in the violation of a fundamental right of the petitioner. For example, the Mumbai Municipal Corporation under the Mumbai Municipal Corporation Act has the duty to keep the streets of Mumbai clean and to maintain a decent environment. If the Mumbai Municipal Corporation fails to clean a particular street resulting in a health hazard, the residents may file a writ of mandamus seeking that the Mumbai Municipal Corporation should keep the streets clean and as they are not performing their duty, it is affecting their right to life, meaning right to health which falls under Article 21 of the Constitution. Now let us look at this case, Union of India versus S.B. Vora. In this case, the Supreme Court describes what is meant by mandamus. Mandamus literally means a command. The essence of mandamus in England was that it was a royal command issued by the King's Bench, now the Queen's Bench, directing performance of a public legal duty. A writ of mandamus is issued in favour of a person who establishes a legal right in himself. A writ of mandamus is issued against a person who has a legal duty to perform but has failed and or neglected to do so. Such a legal duty emanates from either in discharge of a public duty or by operation of law. Two very interesting writs which are very closely related writ of prohibition and writ of certiorari. First, we will discuss the writ of prohibition. A writ of prohibition is issued by the higher judiciary, that is the High Court of the Supreme Court against a lower court. When the lower court is entertaining a matter which it has no powers or jurisdiction to entertain. For example, the powers of the Magistrates Court and the Sessions Court are very different. When a Magistrate Court entertains a case which only the Sessions Court may entertain, the Supreme Court will prohibit the Magistrate Court from continuing or proceeding with that matter. The important part of writ of prohibition is that the matter is pending before the court which has no authority to entertain it. 
The only difference between writ of prohibition and writ of certiorari is that in certiorari, the matter has been finally disposed of by the court, which has had no powers to entertain it. So in the writ of certiorari, the Supreme Court cancels the order passed by the lower court or revokes such order. So the main difference is the stage of the matter. In prohibition, the matter is still pending. In certiorari, the matter is disposed of. Please read Hari Vishnu Kamat's case. It not only tells us what is writ of prohibition and certiorari, it also tells us about the difference between both these writs. It states that they are issued at different stages of the proceedings. When an inferior court is hearing a matter which it has no jurisdiction to hear, the Supreme Court can be moved or the High Court for a writ of prohibition. Such writ will forbid the inferior court from continuing the proceedings. Whereas, in a writ of certiorari, the decision has already been passed. So, the superior court will quash the decision passed by the inferior court. The next writ we are discussing is the writ of co warranto. In this writ, the Supreme Court is required to decide on the legality of a claim to a public office. That means that the petitioner is objecting to a public office being given to a particular person on the ground that he is not qualified or that the petitioner is better qualified or that some other person is better qualified to that public office. The writ of co warranto is extremely important to control nepotism and favoritism at the hands of the executive organs of the state. It is necessary and imperative to ensure that the most fit person gets the public office. Let us see what the Supreme Court had to say in Renu versus District and Sessions Judge. The co warranto proceeding affords a judicial remedy by which any person who holds an independent substantive public office or franchise or liberty is called upon to show by what right he holds the said office, franchise or liberty, so that his title to it may be duly determined. And in case the finding is that the holder of the office has no title, he would be ousted from that office by judicial order. In other words, the procedure of Co warranto gives the judiciary a weapon to control the executive from making appointment to public office against law and to protect a citizen from being deprived of public office to which he has right. These proceedings also tend to protect the public from usurpers of public office who might be allowed to continue either with the connivance of the executive or by reason of its apathy. So now we have completed the fundamental rights which are contained in part three of the constitution. As we mentioned, the main characteristics of fundamental rights is that they're enforceable and justiciable. And if a person's fundamental rights is violated, he may approach the Supreme Court for redressal. And under Article 226, he may also approach the High Court. Now we are going to part four of the Constitution which is titled Directive Principles. Directive Principles confirm that India is a welfare state and that the state has to take measures to ensure that people attain social, economic and political justice as also distributive justice. Article 37 of the Constitution describes directive principle. Please read this article carefully and closely. 
application of the principles contained in this part shall not be enforceable by any court but the principles therein laid down are nevertheless fundamental in the governance of the country and it shall be the duty of the state to apply these principles in making laws what do we understand by article 37 one it is not enforceable by any court two it is fundamental in the governance of the country three it is the duty of the state to apply directive principles while enacting legislations now we shall look at the main characteristics of directive principles this slide explains the main characteristics of directive principles it expresses the aims and objectives of a welfare state it propounds the concept of social, economic, and political justice. And most importantly, governments must intervene for the well-being of the weaker sections. When we talk about social justice, economic justice, and political justice, we are talking about reducing inequalities in society. Now let us look at the differences between directive principles and fundamental rights. Fundamental rights, as we saw earlier, are enforceable. Directive principles are not enforceable or justiciable. The next difference is that if a law violates the fundamental rights, the Supreme Court or the High Court can declare such law as void. But if a law violates a directive principle, the Supreme Court and High Court cannot declare it as void. A fundamental right mainly relates to the rights of individuals, whereas the directive principles relate to societal or community rights. Fundamental rights relate to civil and political rights, Directive principles relate to economic, social, and cultural rights. The directive principles show India to be a welfare state. The obligation of the state to create an environment where social, economic, and political justice is prevalent. The emphasis is on creating a just society for people. Article 38 clause 2 please read it carefully under this article the state is required to minimize inequalities inequalities in income inequalities in status facilities and opportunities not only amongst individuals but also amongst groups of people residing in different areas or engaged in different vocations the state is required to ensure that people living in all parts of the country enjoy facilities and opportunities whether you are residing in a city or you are residing in a more remoter part of the country for example wherever you reside you should have opportunity to transportation Article 38 also speaks about giving equal concentration to all different vocations. It mainly refers to agriculture and industry. In the name of industry, we cannot forget the plight of farmers. Both these sectors should be given the same amount of concentration. Article 39 portrays the socialist nature of the state. Article 39 has six clauses from A to F. We are going to concentrate on clause B and clause C. Please read clause B carefully. That the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. Let us try and understand each term. What do we understand by material resource? 
A material resource includes both a natural resource and a man-made resource, whether it is publicly owned or privately owned. What should these resources be used towards? It should be used to subserve the common good. What do we understand by this phrase? It embodies the principle of distributive justice, that our resources are distributed amongst all, so that all can enjoy these resources. For example, water and coal is a resource a natural resource which is converted into electricity whether by the state or by the private party but it should be distributed in a manner so that all are able to enjoy the same now please read clause c carefully that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment this states that it is not the owner alone who should enjoy the fruits of production. They should be distributed amongst the workers and also amongst the rest of society. Because if it is merely enjoyed by the owner, it will be detrimental. Here we've looked at constitutional remedies which is article 32 of the constitution which allows a person to approach the supreme court in case of violation of fundamental rights the supreme court has often intervened in favor of the petitioners whose fundamental rights are violated Article 32 is extremely important because it portrays the justiciable nature of fundamental rights We've also understood what the term directive principle means. Though directive principles are not justiciable, they are a very important part of the constitution as it assists in creating an egalitarian society. Thank you.